So our first speaker is Jen Hammock. Jen, can you take it away? You got what you need to sure. do? Sure. Yeah. All I right. Think my name is Jen Hammock. I work for the Encyclopedia of Life. I've been in the Taxon Pages ecosystem for about 15 years. Um, and uh, for this mental meander, I was, I've been starting to wonder recently about the roles of humans and machines in composing things like taxon pages. Um, and so for our purposes, I'm thinking of automation as just the use of a machine to make human effort more efficient. And of course, that's not a binary thing. It's a question of degree. Um, even this guy was abetted somewhere down the line by a printing press. And before anyone gets super excited, I am using this example just to show that we and machines go way back. Um, I am not going to be talking about species description. If you missed yesterday's fantastic session on species discovery and description with the use of automation, it should be on YouTube real soon now, um, so don't worry. Um, but primarily, I will be talking not about primary literature, but about the reorganization and dissemination of knowledge on the internet. Anyway, back in Linnaeus's day, there were really a couple of options for disseminating this information. Someone could have copied it out by hand many, many times, or they could have used a machine. Um, that led me to my first hypothesis, that there's a trade-off between available human resources and the need for automation. Well, we'll see about that. Let's see, is this, yeah, let's go live. Uh, so, a contemporary taxon page, uh, again, here my definition is pretty broad. I'm thinking of any document that lives on the internet that uses a taxonomic name as its title. And there are many, many different kinds, obviously. This is an example of what I would call a professionally curated taxon page. And I don't mean any judgment by professional. I just mean um, the people responsible for this page are paid either for this work or for very similar work while they do this sneakily on the side. Both do seem to happen quite often. Um, in this case, it's easy to see the role of automation. I'm just gonna move some more things out of my way, sorry, there we go. Uh, it's clear that this page is underlain by a database and there's lots of benefits to that, right? Um, for one thing, that database can support many different web properties and printed products. So you can reuse that information indefinitely. Um, other things that it allows you to do very easily is create links among different pieces of information. As any denizen of the internet will tell you, chunks of information are nothing without the links that allow you to navigate from one to the other. So you can climb up the ancestry of this species, you can look at related names, um, you can get to all kinds of other different pieces of information from here. Um, elsewhere on the artisanal spectrum, here's a taxon page in Wikipedia. This is produced by a very different process. Uh, this is a community of self-selected curators, but they will end up with a lot of the same information you'll find on some professional taxon pages. I find that comforting personally. Um, so here it's easier to see the hand of a human than it is to see the automation. This is narrative text, probably partly in deference to the presumed preferences of their much broader audience, also probably due to the preferences of their contributors for writing narrative text. So how did this end up here? Uh, it started with a first draft written by a single human, and a lot of this text persisted right till the uh, current version. Uh, but let's notice a few things about this version of the document. In this case, this moth is assigned to the family Noctuidae. It has a subfamily. There are a couple of references to external resources, and it's tagged with a couple of categories which group it with similar articles elsewhere on Wikipedia. Again, this is con connections for discoverability. And uh, if any apostrophe police are present today, you will possibly have noticed this it's. Okay, so compared with that, the current version has moved to a different family. It no longer has a subfamily. It has one reference, but neither of the original references. And there are four category tags, none of the original ones having persisted this long. So lots of edits have happened. And uh, ooh, the poll has reappeared for me. Is, is everybody seeing it? No. No. Okay, okay, I'll just move it back out of my way. Um, 
so a lot of work has been done clearly. Let's take a closer look at it. Uh, I wonder if you can see the highlighting from my control F. Yes, yeah, we see it, Jen. Thank you. Um, so a lot of work was done by 15 busy humans and six bots. Um, among And so bots here are scripts which are used by humans to do tedious work that would take a while by hand, but this is just a more efficient way of doing it. For example, um, this article at one period carried a category tag, Moths of the United States. And a couple of years ago, JJMC89 Bot 3 came through and changed that to Moths of North America. This followed a discussion among, among a bunch of humans. And the nature of this discussion won't surprise any of you. This is the kind of thing that humans always have to decide when they're taking care of data. They were not sure that country barriers were country borders were a useful delineation, and they eventually decided to go with continents instead. I call this organic standardization because they're trying to become consistent, but they don't actually have sweeping powers to do things to the database. They're just changing their practices within their sub community. So they're aware that there are other organismal groups that are using this kind of country boundary uh, category tag. And they're thinking about that. And in the end, um, one of the things that was noted was they made a decision that was consistent with the one made by the butterfly people. So sort of gradually across the surface of Wikipedia, people are changing their data model one bit at a time. Um, in addition to the actual bots, <clears throat> excuse me, there is another tool being used here called AWB, um, and that is a semi-automated Wikipedia editing tool. And the first thing they want you to know about it is you take full responsibility for anything you do with it. This is still a tool in the hands of humans. Um, so it's a little bit less automated than an actual bot, which you can send out and it will do 50 edits by itself. Um, you have to arrive at each of the places, but you as a human are making your life a little bit more easy and efficient uh, using this tool. Um, so one thing that AWB did way back here, um, it helped John of Reading to replace its with the apostrophe with its, the correct its without the apostrophe. So lots of routine maintenance tasks were made easier for these humans by these assorted tools. And there's a wide range of things being done. There's uh, routine grammatical changes. There are more weighty decisions involving the organization of data. Um, and that led me to wonder uh, one other thing, um, which was just about these backroom discussions and how much the platforms themselves evolve in response to the input and preferences of the uh, participants. And of course, that's not confined to Wikipedia. Professional communities do all of this also. They collaborate not only on the creation and maintenance of content, but on the tools and processes and documentation of their platform. That's very common because it's healthy for a data platform. Oh, there's another example here too, I think. Yeah, this is still in TaxonWorks. We've heard a little bit about this already. This is the feedback tool used just for communication and discussion of these issues. And GitHub is a very common choice for this kind of communication. Um, so I had to modify my hypothesis. I'm, I'm starting to think that the wider, the different range of humans you have, the different priorities they have, the different tasks they want to work on, that's the, that is what determines the number of automated tools that you need. Um, a couple of other things to note about this platform. It is, uh, this particular article is available in three languages. Um, the uh, Vietnamese language, for example, was added. The initial um, version of this page and most of the subsequent edits were all done by bots. Uh, but as you can see, uh, not everybody um, went ahead. So not all available Wikipedia languages are present here. There is still a limit to what people are willing to do. 
And it's not too surprising that translation was partial. Um, and once a translation is made, someone is gonna have to be responsible for it or a bunch of bots are. Uh, so not every Wikipedia language community has decided to go with the same rate here. Um, translation is an important part of accessibility and the um, the fair fairness and, and accessibility priorities that a lot of these uh, platforms are working on. Um, the other thing that will influence discoverability, of course, is uh, link it, link linkages and connectivity. So as you can see, the narrative text is richly linked and so is the taxonomy. Those links all go to other pages within Wikipedia, but there are also a number of external links. Um, one prominent feature that is very common on Wikipedia now is, uh, especially on taxon, taxon pages, are links to the corresponding taxon page and other platforms. And you can also find those very commonly among the references cited in a uh, uh, taxon page. And that's true of any taxon page platform. There are usually references that go to corresponding pages. About and, two minutes left. Oh, gosh. Um, in addition to, okay, I guess I, this is going to be truncated. In addition to links, a lot of them also share content, um, Wikipedia text being a very common example. Um, and of course, linkage is not a new concept. You need that back in Linnaeus's day also that took up the first half of this taxon uh, description. So most of my personal experience is in EOL, the Encyclopedia of Life. We have a, um, a mandate for all known taxa and all even remotely interested audiences. So scalability is a problem for us. Um, we benefit from the efforts of all open access biodiversity data hubs. So we get um, images from iNaturalist and map points from GBIF, among the various other providers. Recently, we have been concentrating on um, attribute and trait data. And where possible, we show that off in data visualizations. Oh. So where um, ecological relationships are available, we like to put those into um, interactive data visualizations. We get all of these from Globee. And this of course is bait to lure people into learning about different organisms. And where um, we have the data available for habitats in higher taxonomic groups, we try to bring people into our uh, search interface through interactive visualizations also. So these are all tools for discoverability. Um, and this kind of automation is supported by controlled vocabulary. We borrow terms from existing ontologies and they have relationships among them. So because our system understands that there are subclasses to coastal water, it's able to include those subclasses in a search result. Uh, we can also facet these this interface so that you can narrow down your search either by going to smaller subclasses or by using additional facets. Um, we also do translation of the controlled vocabulary, which scales much more easily than narrative text would for 2 million pages. That's important for us because one thing we know about our audience is that they come from all over and less than half of them speak English. Um, for what it's worth in our top 10 traffic languages, all but uh, Russian and Japanese are the ones that are currently supported on the website. So there may be a correlation there. We don't know which direction the causality goes. Um, oh, and so one thing I wanted to uh, point out before we close is that it's not just um, the people we know who are making tax on pages. Oh, let's go uh, to, sorry, there is the live one. Um, there are lots of web pages out there that I had never heard of. I found this one a couple of days ago. Um, it does not specialize in biodiversity. It turns out to specialize in size, and it's a good place to go to compare a yellow tube sponge to a piece of IKEA furniture. 
I don't know what this means for our users, especially our broad audiences, um, but it is probably true that most humans will never come to a taxon page that one of us is responsible for. So there are many other ways they might encounter uh, this kind of information and it's worth being aware that those routes exist. Uh, so finally, after thinking about all of this, one of my conclusions was it's actually not the automation, um, whoops, sorry, that makes uh, this taxon page ecosystem complicated and interesting, but as with everything else, it's the humans. Sorry, I think I've run over. You're just fine. It's just yeah. lovely, Jen. Cool. Thanks, Jen. That was really wonderful. Um, I love I love the insights you get when you that you uh, presented on looking through wiki species and wiki data. Um, it really the how things drift over time is really key, right? Like, how is that going to change what we do? And yeah. um, synchronizing all of this duplication is I mean, yeah. it probably keeps half of us up at night. Right. And so so what does that mean? I, yeah, it, it'd be interesting to have a, a much longer conversation with with you learning about the history of EOL and learning about where you might be headed and, and that kind of thing. So if you are around for the unconference, maybe we can raise that as a if you have the time. I'm not sure or not, but yeah, I can be here if there's if there's interest for a discussion just of yeah, what we all want from taxon pages. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would love to hear from other people.